today, FOMO versus inflation versus Evergrande. A market update for the 23rd of October 2021. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics, where I notice posts covering finance and property news with a distinctively Australian flavour. In today's show, we look at the market action this week as the tensions between strong, if patchy, corporate results on one hand and inflation risks and contagion risks from the China property sector pull in two different directions. China Evergrande Group pulled back from the brink of default by paying a bond coupon before Saturday's deadline, giving the property giant at least another week to come to grips with a debt crisis that has rattled investor confidence in the world's second largest economy. But investors are increasingly concerned that higher cost pressures and global supply chain bottlenecks will push the Fed to raise interest rates faster than expected. Yet a relatively solid start to the earnings season offset those fears with the benchmark S&P 500 hitting a new top on Thursday. But then US equities fell on Friday in New York after the chairman of the Federal Reserve signalled more concerns about inflation. The S&P 500 closed down 0.1% to 4,544. That's just shy of its closing record of 4,549. The Dow Jones Industrial Average added 0.2% and the Nasdaq Composite slipped 0.82%. As Jerome Powell said, the central bank was monitoring price pressures carefully and would adapt accordingly. Tech, which has played a big role in the recent market melt-up, was under pressure after Snap's warning on slowing revenue growth. And that followed Apple's privacy-related changes to its mobile operating system, iOS. A slump in Snap triggered a sea of red in tech, just as federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell attempted to quell concerns about the prospect of earlier rate hikes. Global supply chain constraints and shortages that have led to inflation are likely to last longer than previously expected, likely well into next year, Powell said, while adding that it is still the most likely case that these constraints will ease. It's time to taper, not to raise rates, Powell said. And the remarks arrived against the backdrop of growing concerns the Fed may be forced to hike rates sooner rather than later to curb inflation pressures. The Fed chair continues to suggest the pace of inflation remains transitory, though he did say the central bank would use its tools to, quote, guide inflation back down to 2% over time. At the same time, we think we can be patient and allow the recovery to take place and allow the labour market to heal, he added. The market is getting more worried that we are in some kind of a longer-term inflation rise, said Jim Bianco, president and founder of Bianco Research. Stocks won't like it if the Fed responds to inflation, and bonds won't like it if they don't, he said. That's not a good scenario. The losses came after the S&P 500 struggled for direction earlier in the session after disappointing tech earnings overnight. A warning on ad spending from Snap wiped out more than 100 billion US dollars of market value from the social media company and its peers including Facebook, Google owned Alphabet, Pinterest and Twitter. Snap shed 26.7%, Facebook fell 5.1%, Pinterest shed 5.4% and Twitter lost 4.8%. Meanwhile, Intel also fell on lower than expected sales amid component shortages. A double whammy of bad news for the tech sector could well mean that record highs are out of reach for now. Fiona Sincotta, senior financial markets analyst at City Index, wrote, I would expect the potential for more volatility, said James Reagan, director of wealth management research at DA Davidson. We just might get the possibility of some of these big companies to disappoint a little bit. While the S&P 500 has demonstrated a resounding ability to shake off bad news, an epic divergence has developed between positioning and economic expectations. And while fear of missing out or FOMO keeps sentiment near the high end of its range, third quarter GDP growth is projected near the lower end of its range. For example, the Atlanta Fed's third quarter GDP growth estimate was north of 5% in early September, but then the bank reduced the estimate to 1.3% on October the 5th, 
and now they've come back again and they've cut its Q3 GDP growth estimate to 0.5% on October the 19th. And Bank of America also released its latest global funds manager survey. And institutional investors are increasing their equity exposure just as their economic expectations have turned negative for the first time in 18 months. So FOMO is absolutely now on full display. The dark blue line tracks the net percentages of respondents that are overweight equities, while the light blue line tracks the net percentage of respondents that expect stronger economic growth. So if you analyse the right side of the chart, you can see that institutional investors' equity positioning still far exceeds what's implied from economic growth prospects. So as a result, if the dark blue line moves lower and reconnects with the light blue line, plenty of sell orders will hit the market. And separately, a BOA Global Research survey showed that fund managers were slightly underweight technology relative to their average positioning over the past 20 years. At the same time, they named long tech as the market's most crowded trade for the fourth straight month. Supply chain issues, including the semiconductor shortage, are sure to be a topic for iPhone maker Apple, while Amazon could give a window into how the holiday shopping season may be hit by logistics snags. If Apple says, yeah, we would have sold a lot more phones except for the chip shortage, you'd think it's really severe then because they're probably first in line to get chips from everybody, said Peter Toots, president of Chase Investment Council. And the prospect of US government regulatory intervention also hangs over those large companies, so investors will be keen for any insight. This week, the US consumer watchdog said it has demanded information from a number of tech giants on how they gather and use consumer payment data. And finally, it's worth noting that consumer inflation expectations continue to drive higher, reflecting lived experience of higher prices, just look at the oil price, and expectations of higher prices ahead. So in fact, the Fed still seems to be materially behind the inflation curve. The US economy is still on solid footing, but now inflation remains the biggest threat, under senior market analyst Ed Moyer said in the note which added that investors are waiting for more earnings reports as well as the final shape of US President Joe Biden's economic agenda. Congressional Democrats have failed to reach consensus over both the tax and spending sides of a bill to enact the majority of Biden's agenda. And the ability to strike a deal as the week closes is now also in question with Biden himself telling CNN that it does not expect Congress to pass an increase in the corporate tax rate. The 10-year US Treasury yield fell to 1.64%, but still remains higher for the week. And the US dollar edged lower on track for a second week of declines, with the US dollar index down 0.17% to 93.61. A sustained rise in Treasury yields, which moves inversely to bond prices, may also pose a longer-term threat to technology and other growth shares, because valuations of those companies rely more on future cash flows, which are discounted more acutely in standard models when yields rise. It hasn't been all good news on the earnings front, wrote Art Hogan, chief market strategist at National Securities. So far, the good news has won the tug of war against the bad, but we have a long and potentially bumpy road in front of us. Financials, meanwhile, were pushed higher by better than expected quarterly results from regional banking stocks and American Express. For example, SVB Financial Group raised its full-year 2021 growth outlook following third-quarter results that beat on both the top and bottom lines, sending its shares more than 6% higher. This is the strongest preliminary guide the company has introduced in many years, Wedbush said, as it raised its price target on the stock to $800 from $775. Highlights include average loan growth in the mid-20 percentage range, net interest income in the mid-30s, we have previously assumed 24%, they said, core fee income in the mid-20s percentage range, and SVB closed at 753.12, up 6.8%. American Express closed up 5.4%, 287.08, after the credit card company reported third quarter earnings and revenues that exceeded Wall Street's estimates, and they guided 2022 earnings per share within the top of its guidance range. And the volatility index was up 2.8% to 1543. 
Gold futures for December delivery was up 0.7% to 1,794, while crude oil for delivery in December rose 2.06% to 8420. Crude prices edged lower on Friday actually, continuing the previous session's selling after Russian President Vladimir Putin indicated that a group of top producers known as OPEC Plus could increase supply by more than had been previously announced. Still, these comments came after oil rallied to the highest level since 2014 earlier in the week as a global energy crunch prompted by coal and gas shortages in China, India and Europe led to power providers switching to diesel and fuel oil. And that's coincided with a broad economic recovery from the pandemic. And as a result, gas prices and coal prices are up. The EUS dollar was up 0.18% to 1.1643. Over in Europe, stocks gained on Friday, led by consumer shares on positive earnings. And that was helped by an easing of worries surrounding the embattled property group China Evergrande as well as positive corporate earnings, notably from French cosmetic giant L'Oreal. The DAX in Germany closed up 0.46% to 15,542, and the UK's FTSE climbed 0.2% to 7,204. Rimi Cointray stocks rose 1.3% to 1660, and L'Oreal stocks soared 5.08% after the two French luxury good retailers posted strong quarterly revenue growth, benefiting from continued strong demand from primarily Chinese consumers. SED ABB stock climbed 4.73% to 28.330 after the Swedish tissue maker reported a higher than expected rise in quarterly profit thanks to the growing awareness of the importance of hygiene. But on the flip side, Renault, the French auto giant, Warn that its production losses in 2021 will be far larger than previously forecast because of a global semiconductor chip shortage. The economic data slate offered up less impressive news though with UK retail sales falling unexpectedly for a fifth month in a row in September, dropping 0.2% on the month, adding to signs that Britain's economic recovery is continuing to lose steam. Equities in Asia also rose after China Evergrande Group pulled back from the brink of a default, easing concerns about a contagion from the property developer's woes. China Evergrande remitted $83.5 million in coupon payments to a trustee account at Citibank on Thursday, meaning the deeply indebted company will be able to pay interest to all bondholders before the expiry of a 30-day grace period on October the 23rd. Though it wasn't clear how the money was raised, and there is still no sign of a comprehensive restructuring of its $300 billion liabilities, this news has reduced the immediate chance of contagion, and that raised the global risk appetite. The $83.5 million payment to international bondholders surprised some China watchers who had expected Evergrande to prioritise local creditor suppliers and disgruntled home buyers, many of whom are waiting for the company to make good on overdue obligations. And while the news helped fuel the biggest weekly rally in Chinese junk bonds since 2012, Evergrande creditors are still bracing for an eventual debt restructuring that could rank among the largest ever in China. The company's 8.25% bond due March 2022 is priced at just 26 cents on the dollar, even after rallying on Friday, a sign that investors expect deep haircuts. Evergrande's coupon payment, which came at the tail end of a 30-day grace period, marked the latest twist in a saga that's roiled China's $860 billion offshore credit market and cast a pall over a real estate sector that accounts for about a quarter of economic output. Senior Chinese policymakers have tried to reassure investors in recent days that risks from Evergrande are contained, even as they signal a reluctance to bail the company out. The payment looks like an attempt to kick the can down the road, said Wu Coin, executive director of BOC International Holdings. Nevertheless, it's positive and buys the time Evergrande needs for asset sales, strengthening the baseline case for an orderly restructuring. With more than $300 billion in liabilities, the developers have become one of the biggest casualties of Chinese President Xi Jinping's year-long effort to wring the excesses out of the country's debt-laden real estate sector. 
The question looming over global markets is whether Xi can tackle the problem and pull off a sweeping campaign to bring common prosperity to China without derailing the economy's fragile recovery from the pandemic. Evergrande's company payment was nearly due on September the 23rd and the company wired the funds on Thursday and investors will receive the money before Saturday. The 30-day grace period for Evergrande's next dollar coupon payment ends on October 29th and the company needs to pay interest on another $4 notes this year and has a hefty wall of maturing debt in 2022 with some $7.4 billion coming due in onshore and offshore bonds. Some investors, including credit specialist Marathon Asset Management, have been betting that Evergrande's debt still offers value despite the developer's troubles. Marathon Chief Executive Officer Bruce Richards said that his firm has been buying Evergrande bonds and planned to add to its holdings, but others are less optimistic. The company recently abandoned talks to sell a stake in its property management arm and said that it's made no further progress on asset sales. Evergrande's real estate sales plunged about 97% during peak home buying season, further crimping its ability to generate funds. Evergrande is a candle burning on both ends. It needs to address declines in revenue at the same time find cash for looming repayments, said Justin Tang, the head of Asian research at United First Partners. Nothing short of a restructuring or white knight will do. The giant real estate developer is $300 billion in debt and widely expected to default on bond payments. The group owns 1,300 projects in more than 280 cities, but its reach goes way beyond building homes from electric vehicles and media production to mineral water and soccer. The company's woes started in 2020 when Evergrande reportedly sent a letter to the provincial government of Jindang warning officials of a potential liquidity crisis. Evergrande later disputed the letter's authenticity and eventually the crisis was averted when a group of investors waived their right to force a $13 billion repayment. But there's plenty of debt still coming due and ratings agencies see default on the cards. So what could save Evergrande from its downward spiral? Well, in short, Beijing. And now investors around the world are holding their collective breath to see whether the government will step in and offer a bailout or demand a restructure of the company, or whether it will let fate run its course and risk Evergrande's collapse and all the chaos that that could bring. Bondholders, stock investors and rating agencies predict an Evergrande default and say a debt restructuring is almost inevitable and shockwaves are already being felt across global stock markets, triggering losses even in companies with no clear link to China or property. But authorities in Beijing are expected to engineer a resolution rather than allow a chaotic collapse into bankruptcy. And of course, the state runs most of the banks and can exert pressure on creditors, supplier and other counterparties, keeping systemic risk at a minimum. While Evergrande investors would recover only a small proportion of their money, the company's operations would remain protected and unfinished properties could be delivered to their owners. An uncontrolled downward spiral, on the other hand, could prove catastrophic for China's economy one of the major engines of global growth. And aggressive controls to curb outbreaks of COVID-19 are already hurting retail spending and travel in China, while measures to cool home prices are taking a toll. A correction in China's property market, which comprises 28% of China's economy and 40% of household assets, poses a risk to social stability. In the worst case scenario, Evergrande-related stress spreads across the world's financial system and freezes the global credit market. That would be China's Lehman moment, risking a repeat of the global financial crisis and dragging the global economy down with it. Think a real estate crash, surging unemployment, lower wages and projected economic recessions. China, though, has a lot of tools to prevent that, and much of Wall Street believes Beijing will use them if necessary. In fact, China Evergrande shares were up 4.26% on Friday to 2.69% while the Hang Seng also rose 0.42% to 26,126, but the Shanghai market was down 0.34% to 3,584, and the Nikkei was up 0.34% to 28,804. Drew's Composite World Container Index declined marginally by 0.4% to $9,865 per 40-foot container this week, but remains 281% higher than a year ago. Now, locally, Australian shares closed the week 
at a one-month high on Friday, with gains from the technology, financial and REIT stocks offsetting losses from the minerals and energy sectors. The share market closed the week flat, as gains in the retail and healthcare sectors were offset by falls among the miners and energy plays. Travel stocks also climbed on news that Qantas is bringing forward international flights as the federal government loosens border restrictions. The Reserve Bank took on the bond market as well in dramatic fashion on Friday, buying $1 billion of three-year bonds to defend its forward guidance after bond traders wage war on its assurance that the cash rate won't rise until 2024. The move succeeded in bringing down yield after the market pushed the key three-year bond rate past its 0.1% target. It's actual action and a clear signal they're prepared to defend the yield curve control target, said RBC Capital Markets Chief Economist Su Linong. However, she warned, I don't think it will be enough as it's fairly modest in size. The April 2024 bond auction on Friday has ruled off with a weighted average yield of 0.12% close to the central bank's target. And it climbed to a peak of 0.19% on Thursday, signifying mounting doubts as to whether the cash rate can be held flat for the next three years, as Governor Philip Lowe has suggested. So the question is, are the financial markets here mispricing the situation between Australia and the rest of the world? The forward chart suggests two hikes in rates in 2022, which is parallel to those in the US, Canada and the UK. Hence the battle around the RBA's yield curve control. They want to keep the interest rate on the April 24 government bond at 0.1%. That's jumped recently and is putting up a pressure on both the exchange rate and mortgage rates. The Aussie dollar has jumped from 71 cents to 75 cents today and banks have lifted their fixed rate mortgages, signifying higher rates ahead. Hence the RBA move. But of course the question is, will it be enough? And when will tapering of QE start? These are the big questions. Can markets essentially beat the RBA in the light of other central banks moving more quickly? If yes, then rates will move sooner. If no, QE stays and rates stay low, driving home prices ever higher. It's a real pickle, which is why we need a review of RBA monetary policy now, as I discussed yesterday. The ASX 200 rose 53.5 points, or 0.7% through the week, to 7,405. That's the highest close since September the 16th, after closing the session just 0.3% higher on Friday. The week was marked by trading updates from multiple companies as the annual general meeting season ramped up. Market gains were led by the major banks this week, rallying from a weaker performance in the previous week, though a little down on Friday. CBA was down 0.07% to 1488 Westpac fell 0.34% to 2574 NAB slid 0.14% to 2886 and NZ was down 0.11% to 2821 Macquarie Group added 0.62% to 10906 And it was revealed this week to be one of the major winners of the investment bank windfall from the M&A boom. Aristocrat Leisure advanced 0.04% to 47.12 after it made a $3.9 billion bid for Playtech, one of the world's largest online software gambling suppliers, at a 58% premium. West Farmers added 3.7% to 57.31 despite its discount department store chains, Target and Kmart being hit hard by Sydney and Melbourne lockdowns, with its Bunnings businesses still producing robust sales. Tech stocks were mixed, with Afterpay down 0.26% to $126, Xero was down 0.25% to $149.68, and Altium firmed 1.75% to $37.80. Real estate stocks also added to the market gains, with, with Goodman Group rising 1.3% to $22.46, and Stockland Group advancing 0.85% to $4.77. The market gains, though, were weighed by losses from the energy sector, as the ramp-up in oil, gas and coal prices began to show signs of slowing. Whitehead and coal dipped 3.02% to 289. Woodside Petroleum slid 2.84% to 2327. And Santos dropped 2.22% to 704. The major iron ore miners also declined through the week as the price of the bulk commodity fell. 
BHP Group fell 2.1% to 37.65. Rio Tinto slid 1.82% to 95.03. Fortescue Metal Group dropped 0.69% to 1431. Mineral Resources lost 4.02% to 39.38. And Champion Iron declined 3.35% to 462. And finally, Bitcoin fell to 60,793 US dollars at the time of writing. That's down 2.26%, having had a stellar run in recent times as more ETFs come on stream and more mainstream interest flows. For example, multinational retailer corporation Walmart announced the installation of 200 pilot Bitcoin ATMs across the US. For this initiative, the company is partnering with coin cashing machine company Coinstar and crypto cash exchange CoinMe. Furthermore, Walmart says the eventual plan is to ramp up the number to about 8,000 Bitcoin ATMs in total. Sam Dotter, chief strategy officer and head of research at Bidoda, said that the initiative was commendable but not a novelty. According to Dr. there are already several Bitcoin ATMs dispersed throughout many supermarkets. Walmart launching its own Bitcoin ATMs provides more access to the service and underscores its legitimacy. As Dr. put it, Walmart expands Bitcoin access to more people, though, and gives it further legitimacy among skeptics should they roll it out beyond the initial pilot. Coin ATM Radar states that there are currently more than 25,000 Bitcoin ATMs scattered across selected venues in the United States, including grocery stores and service stations. And furthermore, Walmart's co-partner Coinstar already operates 4,400 kiosks enabled by Bitcoin purchases across 33 states. Customers use the Bitcoin ATM by inserting a banknote and receiving a paper voucher, which has a redemption code. Users must then set up a CoinMe account and complete a background check to redeem the code. Furthermore, users cannot withdraw Bitcoin from their accounts if there are no plans for future functionality usage. So at one level, this looks like just a bit of a furphy. But it is worth noting that aggregate Bitcoin futures open interest did rise slightly. In fact, just below all-time levels, that made the local Bitcoin market top in April. While futures open interest and leveraged bets favoring the long side have certainly increased over the recent weeks with Bitcoin's feverish rally past previous all-time highs, there are a few key distinctions between the market structure in April versus what we see now. The biggest and maybe the most significant difference between the derivatives market in April compared to today is the percentage of futures open interest that is using Bitcoin as collateral to enter a position. With Bitcoin derivative markets, you can either use Bitcoin or stable coins as collateral. If you are long, directionally betting on prices to increase, using Bitcoin, then if the price decreases your profit and loss position and your collateral decreases in value in tandem. And that raises the liquidation price of your position. This can result in mass market liquidation events, similar to what happened in May following the April highs. But the percentage of open interest using Bitcoin as collateral has declined significantly since April, from a high of 70.17% to just 45.04%. So perhaps those who got burnt last time learned a lesson or two. We'll see. And so standing back, and as we conclude this week's review, in summary, the Fed's stuck between a rock, high inflation, and a hard place, weak growth. The margin for error has dwindled, and one policy mistake could bring down equity's entire house of cards. So the risks in the system are still there and remain very excessive, in my view. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching. And I'll see you again next time.